And then we get to the discovering of the pyramids. The mystery just you know, gets better and better. Look at that. This is one of the first pictures taken of Johan in 2003 when he started measuring the calendar and finding out all these mysteries. One of the best pictures, because I've been there thousands of times and you just don't get good pictures of the pyramidal structures. There's a third one, a little one over there, just sticking its head out. I've been told through various means that there's about 30 meters of sedimentation down there. So we're only probably seeing half of those pyramidal structures um, because of the flood, remember? <coughs> the flood that destroyed all the stuff. That would have covered all of it. Why are they pyramids? Do I, why am I so convinced they're pyramids? For various reasons. First of all, when you go into Adam's calendar, the moment you cross the circle, because there's no obvious circle, it's an imaginary circle. The moment you cross that circle with your GPS, you lose signal. Okay, it works, this, it works here. The moment you walk in there, your signal is gone. And I love the macho guys. They just love it. Oh, my GPS will work. You'll see. I'll show you how my GPS works. <laughs> <laughs> and they go in there. <laughs> It's, it's fantastic watching them. Just see that ego drop very quickly. <laughs> and then when you take the same GPS down to the pyramids, I stood, there were four of us. I will forever regret not taking a photograph of it because there were four of us standing with GPSs like this. And every GPS gave you a completely different reading. Not just slightly off, but miles off. You were like, you know, in, an, in another province. It was insane, right between the two pyramids. Not only that, but... All these ancient cultures built things according to the sacred geometric principles. So I thought, hold on, this will tell me if it's linked or not. Let me draw a golden mean spiral from Adam's calendar and see where it lands. <coughs> well, you know, I didn't have to guess. You got it. So here we can do a beautiful twist on those that want to stick to mainstream science. And we can argue the argument of probability which is one of the most commonly argued arguments in science, isn't it? Probability. So the probability factor that the golden mean spiral accidentally ends between the pyramids is so completely out of kill that it has to be linked. You're dealing with several million, several billion uh, odds to one that it's you know, an accident. So the probability factor plays a very important role here. We're dealing with something that's connected and... Uh, also through channelings and other psychic revelations, I've been told in no uncertain terms that we're dealing with some very advanced stuff here. And then when you connect Adam's pyramids through Great Zimbabwe, Enki's house, it lands right in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And um, all along the 31 degrees east longitudinal line, the Nilotic Meridian, right, which is also linked to the white lions of Timbavati, the sacred white lions of Africa. And you start seeing all this connection it's just beautiful. It just unravels more and more. And then my beautiful friend, Willem de Swart, who's decoded the numeric system and the secret numbers of God, made it very clear to me that the name Elohim is, equates to the number 31. El Elohim, 31 degrees east longitudinal line. So this gives us an indication that the Anunnaki and the Elohim are the same group of beings. I just recently did an interview with George Nuri. The very last caller that called in told me he was abducted by the Anunnaki 12 years ago before he knew any of the stuff we're talking about here. They told him they were tall, about nine feet tall, blonde, blue-eyed individuals. They told him they were the Anunnaki, and they also told him they were often referred to as El or Elohim. That was very interesting, and then the show ended, so I need to talk to him more. So what were all these stone circles for? millions and millions of stone structures all connected. Each one is completely unique, different, built with stones that ring like bells. What's going on here? Archaeological drawings show us that there are no doors and entrances, and some of them are concentric circles, like expansion, amplification chambers, or something to that extent, right? So are these connectors, these channels, actually like wires? Absolutely. So let's go back to what Nikola Tesla said. He said the earth rings like a bell and it's an inexhaustible source of energy if you know how to use the sound frequency of Gaia. And I believe that this is what it is. The cymatic patterns remind us of what we're looking at. The shape of Om. This is the shape of Ah, sand on a metal plate. That's what you'll find. So what we're looking at here is cymatic patterns from earth. Each one of these stone circles just simply represents the cymatic patterns freak or the shape of the sound of Gaia at that particular point. And this is why they connected. So they created one huge energetic field. 
There's one example. There's a Hans Jenny's photograph, the circle in the middle and the, the spider's web effect outwards, the circle in the middle, spider's web effect outwards, except these were connected so they could share the energy they suck out of Mother Earth. And, uh, but how much energy could these structures create? For this, we've got to go to 1944 and Japan when they were de developing the death ray with which they were going to smite the Allied army. But unfortunately, they got nuked, so they never got to use the death ray. But one of the things that I found out is that at the, at the core of this death ray was a, a thing that they used called a magnetron, a, a resonant cavity magnetron. Well, this is, uh, you know, you start a frequency in the middle, you amplify it in these resonant cavities until you decide when you want to take it out of the wires. And that magnetron is used in laser beams, it's used in microwaves, it's, 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 a, it's a technological tool used in many applications. This has got a little magnetron in it, or a klystron, I think it's called in this. And, uh, and then it goes through what? It goes through a crystal to focus the light. Right? So if you're working with light, you need to use crystal because it lets the light go through it. Right? So... I believe that this magnetron was used, there you go. If a magnetron a few centimeters in diameter could blast, fry the allied, allied army, how much energy can a magnetron 22 meters in diameter create? Huge amounts of energy. In fact, I was made aware that it's this structure that was probably responsible for the destruction of Atlantis because they didn't quite know how to use it and it got out of control. Um, so I believe when you read those translations of Sitchin, where he says Enki built the earth splitter with which in the earth a gash to make, I believe this is the earth splitter or something like that, creating huge amounts of energy, putting it into the giant grid, giant energy grid that connected all these stone structures in southern Africa. And that's really what it was. Everything was linked to the mining of gold. None of these were dwellings, people. We're dealing with a giant energy and work grid for the extraction and the mining and the processing of gold. And then get to the measuring of, the, of these stone structures. And uh, I found a guy who had a very interesting device that he, he measured without me. And then I came back from America and I heard that he went and measured these. I called him back. I said, I want to go back and do it with you. So I went with him and he used to work in the satellite industry uh, for Centec. Uh, interesting guy. Um, and he's, the measurements that he showed me were just mind-blowing. Electromagnetic waves, either horizontal or vertical, coming out of the ground into the sky. Sound frequencies in, in, in hertz, the loudness in decibels, and also what he calls the heat signature. The heat signature that he explained to me, he measures up to, it's the average temperature of the ground below the soil, below the surface, down to about 300 meters. He's got all, all kinds of ways that he calculates this. I can't explain to you exactly how he does this, but I asked him several questions to cross-examine him to see if he was not you know, making it up, and it stayed constant. So... I believe that he does have a system to work this out. This is what he measured. The outside, um, the, the heat signature anywhere outside here is five and a half degrees Celsius at the surface of the, the ground. The moment you move the device in there, it shoots up to 29 degrees. So it's five and a half degrees, 29 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 20. There's no scientific explanation for that that we, that we have right now. You go in there, it goes up to 33 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 33 degrees in the middle. What's interesting, the electromagnetic field here runs at the equivalent of about 280 megahertz, but it's, it's vertical, straight out of the ground into the sky. So it's a column of energy out of the ground into the sky. Over there, it creates like a dome-shaped effect over the circle because you also lose GPS when you go in there. So I can now understand why you lose GPS, because it creates the circle. There's no electromagnetic activity outside. The moment you go inside there, you pick up this horizontal electromagnetic effect, equivalent to about 480 megahertz. Um, and he went into more explanation to me exactly how, how... Sorry, let's go back here. And then the sound frequency. The sound frequency you measured coming out of these walls at 14.5 gigahertz. Now, we don't measure sound frequencies at those. At those. This is really mysterious. So... Um, and at 72 decibels coming out of these walls. And then we went up to this one here, and it got even worse. Um, measured 33 gigahertz sound frequencies coming out of this, these walls inside here. 33 gigahertz. When you walk 
along this, this channel that ran in here, the wall was broken there, but the channel runs in there. It started like five degrees, it keeps going up. As you walk there, that heat signature keeps rising. By the way, the heat signature you explained to me can only go up to about 80 degrees Celsius, at which point it suggests that you've got a volcano under you about 300 meters below you. So that's how he's calculated it. And uh, so at 80 degrees is the max, you know, and nothing more is possible. So we go from five and a half, and by the time you get here, it's at 33 degrees. Um, 30, about 30, about, yeah, around 30 degrees there. When you go from outside there, five and a half degrees, onto that little attachment there, inside, shoots up to 58 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 58 degrees. There's just no reason why it should be doing that. And then the, the electromagnetic waves, once again, there's a dome-shaped horizontal effect that happens inside here at, at that uh, frequency. And it's horizontal. Also, this is why when we did ground penetrating radar, I used the world's leading company to do ground penetrating radar on three structures. This is one of them. There was another one, uh, one of those flower-shaped ones, and then at Adam's calendar. And all the way through the ground penetrating radar exercise, we... Um, I kept asking the guy, are you getting GPS signal? And he says, yeah, sure. And he had a really big GPS thing on his back, and I thought, okay, well, this is our measurements are down the drain. That's it. The guy was lying to me. And then I waited after working like a dog for a whole long weekend, because to do this GPR is not easy. The GPR devices are not meant for rocky terrain. You know, you've got to drag this big box and up the rocks and down the rocks. And I had to do the dragging. So I worked my butt off for the whole weekend, expecting some results. So, you know, a week goes by, and I phone the guys in Joburg, and I say, have you got any results for me? I'm dying to see the results. And say, yeah, I know, we, we've got some problems with, uh, uh, I'll get back to you. A month goes by, nothing. Three months go, eventually I said, just tell me what's going on. He says, look, we've got real problems with the GPS. Uh, every, everything is just completely scrambled. I don't know what happened. I'm really, really sorry. But this, it's just like complete garbage. This has never happened to us before. So I went, don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> you made me the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> because now I know that our measurements are accurate. It looks like you're getting a reading, but you're getting garbage. So when they put it in the computer, the computer nearly blew up. It said, sorry, buddy, I don't like what you're feeding me. <laughs> and then we get to Adam's calendar, and everything we know, or we think we know, just flies out the window. There's the imaginary circle, once again. And as you approach it, the heat signature is at... Nine and a half degrees. It's a little higher than the other places. As you cross that imaginary circle, remember there's no wall. So nine and a half degrees, as you cross in there, it shoots up to 77 degrees. Nine and a half, 77 degrees. But then when you go in between the two calendar stones, it shoots up to beyond 80 degrees, beyond what suggests you're standing on a volcano. This is bizarre stuff. It's not a thermometer. No, this is special calculation. It's a heat signature. It's not the temperature of the ground. Okay, so it's, again, it's the average temperature that he explained to me, about 300 meters below the surface, going up in temperature, suggesting that at about 80 degrees, that heat signature would equate to a volcano, volcanic activity. And then we measured the, the, uh, the, electromag the sound frequency, first of all, once again. Nothing outside. And then as you cross that imaginary circle inside, it shoots up to beyond 375 gigahertz. This is sound frequency. Now, I've never heard of anything before measuring sound frequency at these frequencies. In fact, I've had several people argue with me that sound doesn't exist at those frequencies. I say, oh, well, it just disappears. What happens to sound? It just disappears because we can't hear it. So there's an interesting debate to be had there with some of the brainy people out there. So 375 degree, uh, gigahertz sound frequency. That's insane. That's, that's ridiculous. But then the electromagnetic fields become very important in this discovery. Because as you cross in there, it shoots up to 1,700 megahertz, equivalent electromagnetic activity, horizontally, creating a dome-shaped effect. Again, this is why the GPS doesn't work inside there. But in between those two calendar stones in the middle, it shoots up even higher to 1,800, but vertically straight out of the ground into the sky. And that just blew my mind. Because that made me realize that we're dealing with something very special. Since I first started going there and taking psychics and connected people there, there have been hundreds that have told me things about the site that could not be told unless you knew something. So once again, the statistical probability that they were lying to me is out the window. They must be telling me the truth. 
And the recurring constant, that thing that I've been told by, you know, strange woo-woo people, is that it's an active vortex and a portal. Now that we've measured it, I believe them. Because this is the kind of thing that we measure there. Electromagnetic waves run horizontally, vertically, and then uh, horizontally and then vertically coming out of it is one vertical shaft of electromagnetic waves straight into the sky. So what is this calendar site all about? What were they doing here? What were the Anunnaki doing here? They were getting gold. They were using the people to mine the gold, using advanced technology, Caesar technology, getting it off the planet. We know that they were getting it off the planet. Sitchin makes it very clear in his translations. But he says they, were, they would beam it up with sky ships, I think he was very, very close to the truth, except the word skyships was misinterpreted in his translations. It wasn't skyships. It was a contraption like Adam's calendar. Beam up the gold, Scotty. Where do you want it? That's what we're dealing with here. They were getting the gold off the ground, off the earth, somewhere else. The gold isn't here. One of the biggest mysteries, where's Germany's gold? Where's the gold in the USA? The gold is missing. Suddenly, the, all, all the countries around the world are waking up that they don't have any gold. Well, this is an age-old story. It goes on for all of human history. Remember when the Spaniards arrived in the Americas and everywhere in the world, they found the native populations. They had all this gold, and they asked them, who does the gold belong to? There was always one answer they received. The gold belongs to the gods. And they were right. And they're getting it off the ground, off this planet. So, Caesar technology was only discovered in the 17th June 2009, this was reported on in some of the scientific journals, talking about sound as being used as laser beams. Not light, sound. And they think it's very exciting because it's got great applications in the military, obviously. And this is where the sacred stones come in. Because I believe these are not only energy devices like toruses, toroid energy generating fields because of the special stone that they're made of, but they're also frequency converters. One frequency in, another frequency out. And I believe that these pointy stones, like Ed Lee Skullnan, was reported to move the giant blocks with two ice cream cones in his hands. Well, you hold those two in your hands, it'll look like you're holding ice cream cones in your hands. And at the point where they cross, beaming high-frequency sound waves, they will create levitation. The higher the frequency, the higher the power and the energy, so you can lift huge things up and move it around as you want. Ice cream cones in your hands. Boy, those two schoolboys made my day. <laughs> there you go. What I find interesting is that average three centimeters, which equates to 10 gigahertz. So when we reverse engineer this, I'm looking for laboratories that work on, on laser technology. We can do some remarkable experiments, people. We'll change the world. We'll use these stones, and we're going to discover new energies. And we can, any volunteers, we can put you in front there, set it up. And see what happens if we, if we phase you out or if you're still there. <laughs> 10 gigahertz. So what have we learned from all of this? If we don't learn something from this information, it's completely wasted on us. And uh, I believe we're going to have a break now. Is, it, is that true? We're going to have a break? No, no, no. No break? <laughs> so... Uh, I was going to have a 10-minute break, but mostly for your sanity, I'm used to this. So I believe that we're reaching the conclusion of a prophecy. All the ancient cultures have these great, amazing prophecies that last thousands and thousands of years. And they, they say that the end days will be as the first days. Did you know that in 1980, 80, in the mid-80s, four of the North American uh, native tribes came to South Africa to meet with Kreda Mutwa and some of the African shaman because they believe that the new age will rise out of South Africa. It was quite amazing. And, uh, and they had all these ceremonies at, at these sacred sites and so forth. So the end days will be as the first days. Well, if humanity arose out of South Africa, then it should restart there again. And it makes me quite curious to see what's going on in South Africa at the moment. There's some really interesting things. And I seem to be involved in a few of those for some reason. But um, we're rediscovering free energy. We're discovering that sound is a source of energy. We just need to realize how to use it. Figure out how to use all these ancient stone circles that give us insane amounts of free energy every second of the day. We just don't know how to use it. We're crossing the galactic plane. It's the rise and fall of civilizations concluding these giant, as Plato called it, the great year 
Um, and uh, we're exposed to frequencies and energies that we have probably haven't experienced in the last 26,000 years. So no wonder we're going through, you know, turmoil and a lot of people are going crazy. They don't know how to deal with it. We're exposed to galactic light from the great sun, the, the cosmic, uh, the center of our, of our galaxy. And we're exploding with consciousness. Why? Why are we exploding with consciousness? Because this, this galactic light is activating our DNA, and there's plenty of scientific evidence for that that you can go and look at if you still don't believe that. And it's doing amazing things. It's not just activating our junk DNA, 97% of it. So as our junk DNA gets activated, it creates a feedback mechanism, and we start to think higher thoughts, and our consciousness gets, grows quicker and quicker. It's a beautiful thing, this, people. And it's all connected to these crazy people you know, 280,000 years ago building stone circles in South Africa. They created us and allowed us to get to this point where we can contemplate our own existence and our own humanness and figure out how we fit into this great crazy picture. We connect to the morphogenic field and realize that the resonance is... The morphogenic is the substance of the morphogenic field and, and plays a very important role in, you know, spooky action at a distance that scientists are still trying to get wrap their heads around. How does this all work? And this is where I realized that if we don't learn something from this ancient civilization and apply it today, it's going to be completely wasted. So... I realized that these people lived for long, extended periods of time without money. And uh, it was Kerry Cassidy, when she first came to visit me three years ago, she suggested to me, you know what, you should start a political party. Because when you start sharing this information, it's not going to go down well, and you need to create a platform of credibility and protection. So I did that. And the Ubuntu Liberation Movement has now been registered as a fully-fledged political party in South Africa, and I'm going to be running for president next year. That's a, that's a <laughs> that is a, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. But it's true. It's, I just realized, hey, we're running, yeah. And then somebody said, so it mean, does it mean you're running for president? I had to like do a double take. Oh, shit, yeah. I guess it means that, yeah. <laughs> We're just trying to cause trouble. We're just trying to inject the virus into the organism. But it has some really spectacular side effects <laughs> or things that we have to do. So we are all born on this beautiful planet. And we're all born free. And yet, we cannot move around freely. We cannot live where we choose to. We have to follow rules and laws that we didn't agree to when we were born. We have to work to pay taxes and to earn this thing called money. We didn't agree to that either when we were born. We didn't agree to be given a number and be treated like a corporation. We are living, breathing human beings. We are not numbers of infinite soul and flesh and blood. And yet that's not how we are being treated. The restrictions on humanity are endless and they are getting worse by the day. The current situation is very simple. Every social political system has failed us. This is why we are in this mess. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this stuff, right, if it was hunky-dory. Humans everywhere live in misery. There seems to be no happy outcome to the political and economic mess of the planet. Every year, every month, it gets worse. More poverty, more hunger, more homelessness, more misery. The global economic collapse is imminent. The fact that we still have a global economic system is actually miraculous, but it is a clear indication how powerful those individuals are that control the global economy. They have infinite power as it is now. Only us, only we can do something about it. And there's some simple things that we can do about it to change everything about our lives and how we continue living as living, breathing human beings and not numbers and corporations or fictitious fictional entities. One third of the world's food goes to waste. This is spectacular. What kind of creatures have we become that we deny one-third of the global population food because they don't have money? We don't, give, we don't hand it out. We dump it. We destroy it because we can't give it to them for free. They need money. They need to work, lazy bastards. Do some work. Go get a job. Become a respectable member of society. Get a job. We don't need jobs. It's the last thing we need. Every time I hear politicians say, we're going to create jobs, I sense shivers down my spine. It's the last thing we need. Busyness. 
keep you busy running around forgetting what you should be doing, what kind of life you should be living. It's all encoded in the language that we use. How did it get so bad? This is where we get back to what we've just been to, the ancient civilizations. A small group of royal political families and the banking elite families took control of the world. This didn't happen last year or 100 years ago. This happened thousands of years ago, people. It started with the Sumerians about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East and Sumeria. When the Sumerian tablets tell us, when kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven, that's why I pointed it out to you. They tell us, kingdom was lowered to earth. Suddenly, we see these priest kings appear out of nowhere. How did these guys suddenly took on this higher than now you know, situation? Who the hell are they? Where did they come from? Oh, people lived happily, and, and suddenly one guy said, hold on, I'm going to be your king. You're going to have to work for me and pay taxes. Screw you, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> so how did these priest kings in ancient times become so powerful? Because they were appointed by the gods. I'm not talking about God with a big G here. I'm talking about the gods with a small G, these arrogant pricks that came here and disturbed us on this beautiful planet. And what happened next after they appointed the priest kings? The most spectacular, miraculous thing happened. These priest kings created money. Money is not part of natural evolution. This is a complete misunderstanding of human history. Anyone that teaches you that has not done their homework. Money was maliciously introduced in ancient times as a tool of enslavement, the absolute tool of enslavement, and we are feeling the worst brunt of it right now. We are the guys, we are the civilization, we are the, the people on, in the history of this planet right now that can make a change. It's up to us what we do with this information and how we move from here forward. Today there are three main banking families. There are arguably a few more, but the big ones, obviously, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, they control everything. They own all the banks in the world. How can I make the statement? Because they're the guys that bail out the banks when they go under. So they own them. It's simple, right? If you bail somebody out, you're going to own them. And you're not going to bail something out that you don't own, or at least that you don't control. So the World Bank, the IMF, the BI, the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, Switzerland, most people aren't even aware that there's a thing called the Bank of International Settlement. When they discover this, they, what? Wow, that's amazing. I hope they're good people. <laughs> Can't they give us a loan? <laughs> Remember, people, money doesn't exist. Okay, I'm going to get into this. Uh, yes, did you want to say? Okay. No, 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 no. I don't, no, no. Well, that's, that's no, no, no. You, you're getting the wrong end of the stick. We, we, we created the. Yes, you are. We created the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. I'm going through it now. Just hold, hold on. You'll understand where I'm going with this. Okay. There, there's okay. going to be a lot of point in time to ask questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll... Don't worry, you'll get it. You'll, you'll get it by the time we finish here. Yeah. I'm sure you will. Uh, the banking families own the world. It's simple as that. If you don't believe that, then you also haven't done your homework. So all the discussions we've been having, and I've been going into many of these discussions, money keeps coming up all the time. But remember, money doesn't exist. Money is just empty promises. It, there is no thing as money. In fact, for those of you that know, I've been, I've been actively involved in legal cases in South Africa against the banks. Not just the banks, against the Central Bank, the South African Reserve Bank, the Minister of Finance as well. I've even opened up a constitutional court case against the banks, the Minister of Finance, and the Reserve Bank, uh, which had an interesting ending. If we have time, we can talk about that. But uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, two years ago, myself and a small group of other people, mostly Scott Cundall, started uh, asking the banks certain questions. And, um, and we couldn't get answers out of them. And then we started doing research and realizing how it all works. And for the fractional reserve system, you all know that, or you should know that. And the fact that money doesn't exist. In fact, in the South African Bank Act, to my horror of horrors, and I was in court, and I was doing research to stand up and defend myself, because the only way we can do this is to, when you stand up in court and defend yourself. So we didn't use lawyers. I went there, and I stood and defended myself against the, the most you know, highest paid lawyers money can buy. 
and not just one of them, I was alone in the court against the judge that you have to call my Lord and bow down when you walk into the court, my Lord. And you start realizing the cabal, ritualistic club that these people belong to. It's spectacular. They wear black robes. And you go there, go there and call it, my Lord, my Lord. I, you know, I thought I was going to cause trouble at first, but then I bit my tongue and I didn't do that. <laughs> and, and, but what I found is that in the Bank Act in South Africa, and I'm sure the same goes for, for the rest of the world, there is no definition for the world money. There is, however, a definition for bills of exchange, promissory notes, and negotiable instruments. And I realized the banks don't work with money. The banks work with promissory notes, bills of exchange, and negotiable instrument. And, and those are called liquid because they have value. They are the liquid, ne valuable instruments, negotiable instruments, that banks work with behind the scenes. And this becomes really exciting and interesting. So we started realizing we could create promissory notes and bills of exchange and liquid negotiable instruments as soon as they have our signature on it. And we started doing some of this, just causing trouble. Anyway, it didn't get us very far because the judges didn't understand this at all. They thought we were, we were just causing trouble with the courts. But nevertheless, what we managed to do in the three Supreme Court cases that I defended myself against these banksters, we managed to get very important things out of the lawyers or the bankers. They admitted to everything we accused them of. We accused them of breaking the, bank, the, the contract law because they don't have what they pretend to loan. They don't have the money. Remember, in contract law, you, need, you can't lend something that you do not possess. So when, that was one of our arguments. So we said, well, the banks aren't actually banks because they don't own any money. And they admitted, yes, no, we don't own any money. So, OK, great. Judge, did you get that? And, um, and then we said, well, that means that you're an agent and you're not a banker. So you can't charge interest and you can't come after me because the contract is null and void. And then we realized that they securitize your signature. They sell every document you have, every document you sign with your signature on it and has a value on it, is sold into, in a process called securitization. And uh, this is a global industry. Global banking industry works with securitization. And they're very proud of it. They publish the securitization information on their websites. But then when you argue securitization in court, they deny it. They say, no, we don't know what you're talking about. No. And the judges don't go and do their homework because the judges are so blinded by the banks and the lawyers, they just follow, they just can't imagine that the banks could be lying. So they, they agree that they practice securitization. Well, first of all, they, they, they denied that, that there is anything called securitization. They accused us of being fanciful and, and making things up and um, that they didn't have money to lend. We accuse them of not having locus standi or any rights to start the action against you because they sell your documents and your contract to a third party called a special purpose vehicle. And that special purpose vehicle company is a third party that takes complete ownership of your property, your car, your credit card debt, your overdraft. Everything is securitized by the banks because they don't have money. That's how they make money for themselves. It's all shuffling paper and bookkeeping entries and selling empty promises. And this is how junk bonds are created, because once you haven't paid on your bond, three months after you haven't paid on your home loan, your bond, uh, that goes stale. The, what this, the, secure, the SPV uh, does, they then claim insurance on it, and they, they file it. So the SPV gets paid, the bank has been paid the moment they sell your signature to them. Everyone's been paid, but you keep paying for your home loan for the next 30 years. The moment you stop paying, the bank comes after you, says you owe us money, there's a contract, my lord. See, he signed a contract, he owes us money. And the judge doesn't for one second say, well, hold on, let's look at the validity of this contract. Do you have rights to this contract? Who owns the property? So this has now been exposed. We are this close in South Africa. Myself and Scott Cundell from New Economics Rights Alliance, we are this close from bringing down the banks. Yes. This close. Yes. So, Because they're just lying thieves. What you're, talking, what you're talking about, the global banking industry, people, is nothing more than the largest legalized organized crime syndicate. That's what it is. So they're a bunch of criminals. We've got to do something about it to stop it. So I